Hello everyone and welcome to the round four edition of Footyology, the show actually full of football and mercifully free of fluff. I'm Rowan Connolly, with me is my co-host Mark Fine, and like we do every week, we'll be giving you a football shave so forensically close you'll need 32 lubricating strips and a pretty wife patting you admiringly on the shoulder to go back to work afterwards. We've got a good guest today in our new segment with John Pyrrhic, an AFL club president no less. We're going to take all your questions via Twitter, take a drive with a former great, do a stock take on your team's credibility and rant to our heart's content. So let's get started. As I say, good afternoon to you, Finey. What's cooking in your football kitchen today? Oh, plenty. Um, obviously, Collingwood and Richmond are on the boil. And whether or not they need to be attended to by the chefs, uh, we'll wait and see. But are we going to do what's hot or not? Because I have got, I am red hot on a couple of things that happened down at Launceston, as you can imagine, mate. Well, funny you should mention that. There were some classics played over the weekend, some great individual efforts, some controversy, and perhaps our first club crisis of a new season. Let's revisit the highs and lows of round four with hot or not. Okay, I'm gonna kick us off. And uh, Adelaide, Sydney, Adelaide, Saturday evening, the game of the year for mine, Finey. Everything, if you, if you were to create a template for football as you want to see it played, this game was it. It was tough. Still plenty of free-flowing footy, plenty of high scoring. Both sides ended up with 100 points each. So we see some uh, vision now. Luke Parker, Isaac Herney, what a gun he is. And it was just played at this pace the whole time in the second half. And a, a, obviously a, a really breathtaking finish. Either side could have won. Eddie Betts, not unusually for him, pops up and uh, kicks a winning goal. But, gee, if a footy stays like that this year, we're in for a cracker of a season. A couple of observations. You, you mentioned um, Heaney. Mm. How about Heaney and Callum Mills? Now, are we going to have, uh, we are going to have an uproar sooner rather than later about these academies. I mean, they are just ready-made guns and Sydney will not take their turn in the evolutionary ladder and go down if they keep getting academy picks like, like those two boys. Yeah, fair point. I'm, I'm happy just to bask in the glow of the, the footy they're playing for the moment until the Swans win another flag. Your turn. Okay, what's hot? Have you seen the pairs of names that is going around in the football in football at the moment? There is a few. Well, how hot are the... You've got Tom Lynch and Tom Lynch. Yep. One's leading the goal kicking, the other one save for the birth of a baby, would be right up there in the goal kicking. He's a beaut player, the ex and killed to Tom Lynch in Adelaide. So Tom Lynch is as good as a pair. Josh Kennedy's, we know they're brilliant. Coleman medalist and Brownlow medal favourite. So you've got Josh Kennedy's going brilliantly. Scott Thompson's are having a revival. Mm. How good is Scotty Thompson yeah. going in Adelaide? Well, they're both good. And the other one's as reliable as old Yeller. Now, there's an exception to every rule. Which one? Mitch Brown's. Oh, tough. Well, you know, one's not playing and the other one's not going. Uh, I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind the Essendon Mitch Brown. No, but, okay. but interesting. Pairs of names. Yeah, very good. My turn. Uh, it's not. And it's people, again, bit of a pet hate of mine, going the knee-jerk reaction on Nathan Buckley. They just re-signed him. You know, how, how are Collingwood going to look if they jettison a bloke they've just re-signed? We're four games into a new season. Yes, he's in a bit of strife at the moment, but give him some time to get out of it. They're still a pretty young list, Finey. You know, young lists are prone to uh, erratic form. And, uh, you know, there's clearly some effort issues going on now. But Was that, was that Gubby Allen or <laughs> Tom yeah, Langdon? Yeah, reminiscent of the Western Oval 1984. Look, they're in a spot of bother, but we've, we've both been very bullish about the Pies this year. I'm not giving up on them yet, and I think uh, people should just back off a bit on the coach. You know, the re-signing of Nathan Buckley reminds me of, was it Tim Webster? Sports Tonight? Oh, yes, After yes. the break. Resigns. Nathan Buckley has resigned. Yes, a hyphen can make all the difference. Well, many years later, he might get it right. <laughs> okay, your turn. Uh, I've got a what's not hot. Look, I know that it, this is going to be considered St Kilda-centric, but we know that that last quarter between Hawthorne and St Kilda and Launceston was not without controversy. And there was an umpire at the centre of the controversy, number 12. is Andrew Stevens. A Andrew Stevens. Felt 15 metres was not achieved on a couple of occasions. Not a lot of people talking about the, about the Puopolo goal, mm. where he took the advantage, stopped, and the umpire said, oh, OK, go back and have a shot at goal, which he cribbed around a couple of metres and then kicked. Well, I thought, being on Twitter, on Sunday night I'd go to his homepage, see what uh, Andy Stevens is saying on Twitter. And I was aghast to see a homepage festooned with a giant Hawthorne run-through from 
the 2012 grand final. No, I saw it. So I reckon you're, you're a bit tough on him. I mean, uh, one, it was just a generic shot of the MCG oh, grand final. Oh, just a generic right? shot of the MCG with a giant Hawthorne banner. Mate, well, mate, they're I've in been the grand Twitter, final. I've been on Twitter for a week. You choose your home page carefully and it, it represents you. Well, did, he, did he not work out that his home page was very Hawthorne looking? Well, he did, because after I brought it up on radio, he went private so nobody could get to the home page, and by the next day, the Hawthorne run through had been replaced with a generic landscape. Well, I don't blame you. I mean, look, these guys get interested in footy because they've grown up loving the game, and presumably, when you love the game, you barrack for a club. And when you barrack for a club, you. I, I, listen, I'm, 15 I'm putting metres. my hand up here. If a few of us in the media use this as a criteria, we're in big trouble. Okay. Uh, Last one, we've got to do these quickly. North Melbourne are my last one for today, and they're obviously hot. The only undefeated side in the competition. Top four two years in a row now, playing some wonderful football. I think they've got the balance perfect. Daniel Wells has been a great uh, return for them. Um, Sean Higgins, Brent Harvey, playing like he's 23, not 58 or however old he is. They are a gun side, and it's ridiculous, I think, that people aren't considering them still seriously as a premiership chance. Very big chance. It's all going perfectly for them. Wade's not going to kick four goals a week every week, is he? Well, and people will say who have they played to, but they've beaten Adelaide, they've beaten an improved Frio. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they're the real They're playing deal. well. I've got a last what's not hot, and that is prices of food at the footy. Yeah, I thought they'd come down last year. Yeah, pies might have in chips. Did you go to the farmer's market outside the Essendon Geelong? I traipsed through a bit of hay on the way to the game, yes. How much are a dozen farm fresh, free range duck eggs supposed to cost? Uh, That's a very good question and I've got no idea. Well, at the footy they were $7.20 and that's too much for duck eggs, I think. (laughs) Well, at least you could take them into the ground, so we've we've won a small (laughs) battle there. All right, it's time for a short break. And when we return, it's a very special tomorrow's news today where we'll be setting the agenda with an AFL heavyweight club's president. As we take a breather, let's check in with our man Grant Dickinson, who's been to all the coaches' press conferences again this week to ask the pressing questions. Grant Hackett right for this week? Yeah, we think so. Yeah, he and, uh, and showmakers is quite often the case uh, with, with players early in the season that they'll just uh, pull up tight and particularly on six day breaks we just don't want to take any risk with our players Need a cooling solution that will stand up in the toughest conditions? Consider a Rapid Cool radiator from Radiator Direct. With industrial and truck radiator technology, Rapid Cool's reinforced radiators are suited to harsh Australian conditions. Radiator Direct, the better cooling solution. Welcome back to Footyology and to our very own news hound, the ages, John Pirrick. What are you doing there? Thought I'd swap seats this okay, week. Okay, well, I'll tell you why you're there. He's done very well this week because instead of looking at what the cat dragged in, he's dragged in the cat. We've got the president of the Geelong Football Club, Colin Carter, with us. G'day, Colin. Good to be here. It's good to, to have you as our very first guest. Now, uh, cat's going well as per usual. Um, how's your long-running campaign to have all those old VFA premierships acknowledged in clubs tallies going? Well, that's an interesting place to start, but it's going well, and I think we'll get there, and the reason we'll get there is because the history is undoubtedly correct. Um, I don't know whether you want to be bored by um, hearing about but the... Oh, you bore us quickly. What, what, what happened was, that I always thought that in 1897, when the VFL started, they discounted the prior history at that point. That's clearly not true. I think the history was revised in the 1930s or the 1940s, perhaps when the... Um, the early VFL founders had moved on and when the relationship between the VFA and the VFL was toxic. But it's very clear, for example, after the show, I'll give you a copy of the front page of the VFL record in 1915, which shows every premiership side back to 1872, and there are no asterisks. They saw it as a continuous history back as far as that. And so we've moved it along to amend it, and we're not, um, uh, we think the AFL will get there, but for example, at our last uh, season launch, we inducted Charles Brownlow who most people have heard of, Mm. into our Hall of Fame. In the AFL records, Charles Brownlow was shown as an administrator, but he was the captain of the Geelong 1883 Premiership side in a competition, by the way, which consisted only, only of teams which became part of the VFL and which part of our history. So to say that that time in history wasn't our own is it's it's a reasonable ludicrous. argument. I think Port Adelaide might end up arguing the same about their Sandful premierships. Port Adelaide's history was in a different competition. Um, 
all six teams that Charles Brownlow won the Premiership against were teams like North Melbourne, Carlton, Melbourne, St Kilda, Essendon. So St Port, Melbourne, Port Adelaide's got a, a wonderful history, but most of that was in playing against completely different teams. And so the issue that we're wanting to address is when did our competition start? Mm. And if we disown that period when 11 of our 12 traditional teams are in the VFA, we disown the right to the oldest football competition in the world, and we certainly deny the efforts of the people whose efforts meant that we're so strong today. There is no doubt Melbourne was the richest city in the world in the 1880s. Um, people were wealthy enough to have leisure. We had a fixtured football competition and there's a great article in one of the papers talking about how 30,000 people turned up to the Lakeside Oval, Oval to watch South Melbourne the play Peter Geelong. Burns game. Uh, just amazing stuff and, and those are the guys who put the platform in for what we have now. And uh, the early VFL founders owned that history so when I was accused at the start of being a historical revisionist, the revisionists are the other mob who sometime in the 30s and 40s, and which created this myth which has continued ever on, that that history doesn't, isn't well, Let's just cut to the chase. How many flags do you win? Um, another seven. Right. Um, okay. And that puts us equal with Collingwood, which is uh, more than passing interest. But that's not really no, the no, point. No, no, no. But that's a collateral advantage, and it's one of the reasons why St Kilda is less oh, interested in it, probably. Well, we need more wooden spoons, so thank you, because <laughs> we'll get them. <clears throat> there is just one thing on that. I mean, the, the argument against it is there weren't grand finals. These occasionally were arbitrary decisions because teams played against VFA teams and also had to factor in games against country teams and local teams. And the ladders are, are up for debate, I must say. Well, the, the ladders aren't up for debate in most of those. For example, in 1896, which is completely whited out of AFL history, there were 13 teams, 11 of ours plus Port Melbourne and Williamstown. And, and, and what people don't realise is that in 1897, when we started our game, there are any number of things which would be unbelievable to people now. For example, the two teams started on opposite sides of the ground and the ball was kicked off, as in rugby, in 1897 in the first AFL year. So, and the, the way in which we reached our premiership side has changed a number of times through the first 30 or 40 years in the VFL. So with, with great respect, Mark. What you just said is nonsense. No, no, he doesn't deserve respect. <laughs> doesn't deserve. Oh. Speaking of premierships, Colin, is the current Geelong team built for a flag this year? Um, every club would like to think they're built for a yeah. flag. Um, we're very excited about our player group, but our footy people said to me, it's a bit like getting a big Christmas present and you know there's something really interesting in it, but you're not quite sure how it's all going to shake out. A lot of these guys are strangers. Um, we had four or five guys come back from long-term injury last year, plus the four guys who came in as, um, from through the trading period. And so we've got 10 or 11, 12 people who've hardly played with each other in their careers. And I think our view is that's gonna take a while to shake down, but we're pretty cautiously optimistic about where this group can take us. If you don't make the top four, is that a disappointment? A every year it's a yeah. disappointment to us. Last year was a disappointment, but this yeah. year it would be too. So, yeah. You know, on face value, Colin, it's been a great start to the year, three out of four, Dangerfield's bedded in at a local hero, but then you've got to remember the passing of Paul Couch really yep. um, casts a different light on the year for Geelong. And I think Geelong, the football club, played a really central role in the grieving process and and the celebration of his life. Can you just talk us through what you did and how you handled that difficult period? You mean the club? The club and how you prepared the club, how the club well, the was club, the club ready and available. The club really didn't need preparation in the sense that I think the club we, we set out, like, like all clubs, to honour our past players and, and Couchy went far too early and so the club offered all the support that we could give without being intrusive to the Couch family and they were grateful for the support. Um, I think for a lot of the former players from that era, it was a shock to know that one of their guys had gone because you don't normally assume that and so there was a, it was for them probably more emotional than for a lot of the current players who really didn't, uh, didn't know him but I thought the club handled it pretty well and I think the family um, we're very appreciative of what we did and um, you know, Couch is embedded in my memories. I can still recycle memories of him. His left foot kicks down to the yeah, forward beautiful line. Player. Beautiful player, but um, um, yeah, sadly gone, but it's a reminder to all of us. And one of the things I think our footy club's been good at is a strong conviction that football's not the only important thing in life. And in fact, we believe our guys play better football if they've got other interests. And Couchy's, Couchy's untimely death reminds us that um, there are bigger issues at stake and make sure your family and loved ones and all that sort of stuff are well looked after. I want to ask you a two-part question. Obviously the Essendon drug saga continues to roll on and just when you think it's sort of winding down something else crops up. Now 
the Nathan Bock things come up. Dean Robinson has been a very integral part of that. Just playing devil's advocate here, um, I'm just thinking about the, the guilt by association thing. Now, a lot of people are asking the question, why have, say, Geelong not got off scot-free, but why have there not been more searching questions asked of Dean Robinson's time at Geelong, given that he's now sort of tainted by what happened when he was at Gold Coast and what happened when he was at Essendon? Um, well, first of all, there were searching questions asked of Geelong, and the AFL unleashed a forensic audit on us, and Deloitte's forensic audit team came in, and every email for 10 years was investigated, and absolutely nothing was found. And I think with Dean Robinson, who I barely knew, I met him just after I got involved in the club back there, You've got to remember, he went to Gold Coast on the basis of recommendations from Ken Hinckley and Gary Ablett, mm. and then went to Essendon on the basis of recommendations from Mark Thompson and um, Brendan McCartney. I mean, Dean Robinson was regarded as a good soldier and a good contributor to our club, but he wasn't in charge of a whole area. And um, I'm not in a position to say who and where and under what circumstances people subsequently lost their way. but. That period at Geelong has been absolutely looked at and as, as impeccable. And, and contrary to what sometimes appears in the paper, Stephen Dank has never been employed by the Geelong Football Club. How, how do Geelong and the other power clubs of the competition now view Essendon? Um, I mean, it seems like the, the stain is going to remain on their reputation for a long time. Yeah. They seem to have worked reasonably hard as a club to do what they can to repair that. Yeah. Have they... How far are they along the track to restoring their, their reputation, do you think? Well, I think, um, yeah, their reputation was obviously damaged and the reputation of the AFL was damaged. I think they've made a lot of progress this year, and in part it's because of the spirited uh, response of their players on the field. And I think there's a general acceptance and respect for John Worsfold, who's a really good character, and, and is a person who can really lead them out of that. I don't, um, it's not fair for those of us who aren't part of the process to have too strong abuse about how Essendon had handled it, but um, I'm not a fan of the way the club handled it all through that period. And I think one of the problems they've got in terms of public perception is if, if, the, if your constant position is, we don't know what our players did, but we're sure they've done nothing wrong. They're actually two mutually exclusive statements. You can't, you can't actually believe both of them. You mm. either know what they did or you sure they did nothing wrong. And I think that if you think of all of the other areas where institutions have got into trouble, whether they're banks or churches or whatever, if you sort of said, well, we don't know what our people did, but we're sure they did nothing wrong, then there's no closure or accountability embedded in that. And so I think that's why this hung around as a sort of a, a stain for longer than it probably needed to be. I feel really sorry for the players who were, um, it's a wake up call to all of us that uh, players have got to ask questions and I don't blame them particularly. Mm -hmm. You might argue some of the senior players might have arced up a bit earlier, but um, I think it was a, a failure of, um, good process within the organisation and uh, there but for the grace of God go a lot of us. Mm. We've seen the pressure Richmond and uh, Collingwood under at the moment, particularly with their coaches, Damien Harwick and Nathan Buckley. I think Chris Scott's contracted to the end of next year. Yeah. Well, when do you start to look at that and how you're sort of going to manage that situation? Um, I, I come from a world in which contracts aren't part of our lives. I mean, CEOs don't have contracts anymore, in fact, and you're not allowed to have payouts of more than 12 months. And so to some extent, footy's a bit behind the times with this, mm. but um, I, I'm just amazed at how in, a, in an 18-team competition when it is absolutely inevitable that uh, it's going to be one to 18 and you can't fudge with your success or, or failure that people are out for the coaches so early. Mm. Um, we're only four games into the season. And I mean, we're three and one and probably lucky in one of them. Mm. Um, it's early days. I have enormous respect for Chris, but even more importantly, we've got a really good team of people around Chris. And so, um, and, and it's never just one person. The coaches obviously are really crucially strong person in it but no we so that's something for next summer or uh, later do you think yeah probably yeah. so but I'm, I'm yeah. much more interested in what Chris is doing in 10 years time I yeah. I uh, and I actually I'd, I'd love to be the first club that uh, gets a, has a successful senior coach and encourages them to take a sabbatical yeah come back with batteries recharged and uh, I think we'll get there how long I think a, a lot of us can relate to that yeah. how long a gap could you have though for a sabbatical I reckon if, 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 you, if with the structures you've yeah. got these days and everybody, I mean, footy, clo footy coaches traditionally mm. saw themselves as completely indispensable because they probably were, they ran everything. But if you couldn't give them three months, um, say November, December, January yeah. or something like oh, that. Oh, not miss a season though? No, I don't no, see any reason for that. Yeah, 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 give yeah. them three months to go and yep. charge the batteries. Colin, just one last quick one. From your time as commissioner, there's a bit of heat on Mike Fitzpatrick 
some say his time might be up, maybe Travis Old or somebody else. How do you view his leadership of the commission? And is this, is there still life in Mike, Mike Fitzpatrick as the boss? Well, there's still life, although he's been there for a period of time that most people would start to say you're getting to the end of your your tenure. I mean, there's no precise time, but I'm I'm not in I'm not supportive of a lot of the criticisms that are made of Mike because I think it represents a, a misunderstanding in the footy community about what the role of the chairman of a board is. And if you go to the corporate world, it's absolutely clear the main spokesman is the chief executive and the role of the board is to oversee the management. And, and a journo, one of the journos called me up recently to invite me to slag off at Mike about his low profile as chairman. So I said, well, who's the chairman of the company you work for? And he had no idea. <laughs> um, and, in and so then I asked him, well, who's the chairman of BHP, biggest Australian company? He said, well, is it, uh, and he mentioned a name. And I said, well, no, he's never worked there. And he's certainly not the chairman. So I think, um, um, I think the most of the role, like Gillian McLaughlin is the chief executive and is the main spokesman. I'm not saying the chairman should be invisible, but the, the notion mm. of the celebrity chairman, which footy clubs traditionally had because all the knowledge was in the board and the management was probably the part-time bar manager, is a thing of the past. And, um, mm. and so I think Mike's been partly criticised unfairly because people got the wrong view of what the role of the board is. Well, I think you're a celebrity chairman now, Colin, having <laughs> appeared on Footyology. Uh, th <laughs> thanks for being our first studio guest. Make sure you tell your friends and family and uh, good luck with those extra premierships. Thank you. Thank you. Th great <laughs> to be here. Thanks, and Colin. it's great to have somebody from Geelong in a leadership role that doesn't have crazy hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Let's get to another break. And when we return, it's time for your searching questions and our attempt at fudging answers to them. Grant Dickinson from Footyology. Your upcoming stage show if the Titanic is now under threat because Bobby Murphy and Johannesson are now injured and they were playing the leads, can I suggest Mitch Wallace as the Winslet role because he sort of looks like it? Yeah, well, we, we've schooled our players up in, in lots of roles and that's one of them. Welcome back to Footyology and now it's time for your segment, the one where you get to set the agenda and we try to stay on topic. It's time for Keyboard Q&A. While the punters are loving this finding, we're loving it. Now you've established yourself on Twitter. I see you're getting the hang of it. A few retweets during the week. Yeah, and I'm paying attention because this is not the same shirt I wore last week. No, it's good. It's good. Or uh, the week before. You've just got to start pimping for business with this segment, although they are flooding in still. Any question you have for us, use the footyology hashtag and we will attempt to answer them as best possible. And they're coming in as we speak, Finey. Our first one this week is from Paul, who asks, who would be leading Essendon's best and fairest count at this early part of the season? You're kidding, aren't you? What do you mean? Zaharakis, Zaharakis, Zach Merritt, Zaharakis. Yes, I think it's, uh, there's the Quinella, the Zeds, Zaharakis and Zach Merritt, been outstanding. And, and full credit to Zaharakis, it's been a wonderful effort. He was really under the pump at the end of last year, a couple of disappointing seasons. He's been in and out of that leadership group. Um, point to prove, really needed to step up and he's been terrific. You know who's running third? Uh, I reckon, you know, funnily enough, I think Matt D would be I was doing going to very say, well. D or Matt D? D, or D is Day. the pronunciation. He's, yeah, he's, um, it hasn't had a, hasn't had a loss yet. I don't no, think. he's been terrific. One of the first of the top ups they will re-sign, uh, I reckon, will be the former Richmond player. He's been terrific. And I like Mac Tip as well. Uh, yeah, I heard you tried it. He's now got three names: Mac Tip, Tipper, and Waller. So we'll uh, we'll have to work out which one applies best. Okay, next tweet. Keep them coming. Jeff Hayden. Now, Jeff is a big fan of our game from the US. I've known Jeff a long time, but purely coincidental that his tweet appears now. Not an expat. Uh, no, he's not an expat. No, he's not. Um, well. Your mate AFL czar with total power for one day. What one thing would you immediately change? That's a great question. I would definitely change the match review panel setup. First of all, umpires don't need to report. It's a messy process, and I don't like points, I don't like intentional or reckless, just show a bit more intuition. Just tell us how many weeks and keep it simple. They've simplified it, but it can be made even more simple. I reckon I'd go on a bit of a um, staff cut at AFL headquarters, to be honest. Uh, employ about 2,000 people now with positions you've never heard of. Well, you are. You don't have to cut them. You can put them into gulags or something. Go execute them. Yeah, nice. I'm just kidding, people at AFL. I love your work. Okay, next one up on the screen. Thanks very much. And it's Matt Lang. Oh, yes, this is a good one. It's right up our alley. Can you liken each team on current form to an Australian rock band? And easy place to start there. I think the Collingwood Football Club this week definitely are the Wiggles, Finey. 
Now, I, I, can I go outside Australia? Because Richmond and Millie Vanilli to, to me. Imposters. I mean, imposters. They're, 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 whatever they're saying, it's not coming out of their mouths. They're, they're, they are not who we thought they would be. Anywhere near what we thought they would be. I just, I, yeah. as, as an Aussie band, I'm not quite sure. Oh, I'd just like to go one more. I think uh, Carlton probably scrape into that ACDC camp, as in haven't had a decent album for 30 years and a dodgy lead singer. Yeah. Um, Fremantle, Kush. <laughs> Kush. Come on, there's people under 50 watching this show. Okay, nice tweet. Next. <laughs> <laughs> And Dem asks, if Melbourne can beat Richmond and the Saints over the next two weeks, are we looking at a potential top eight finish? We'd have to say yes. I mean, they've been, uh, aside from the Essendon debacle, finally, they've been pretty impressive. They've been fine. They've, they've, they've been probably what they should be. Honestly, were you down South Yarra at all over the weekend? No, why? Or after the Melbourne win? They've got kids in scarves. I mean, they're, they're no, I'll give them a break. It's been 50 years. Yeah, well... Calm down, calm down. <laughs> two, two out of four, you're going along, okay. So this, this is St Kilda supporter, it's the equivalent of that Monty Python sketch. You think you've got it tough. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. You live in a cardboard box in the middle of the freeway. Yeah, look, uh, Melbourne are two from two and they lost to Essendon, so... Oh, they're going perfect. all right, the Ds, I'm with you. Good to watch, much better than that defensive rubbish you were playing a couple of years ago. Next tweet, come on, keep them coming. Nick Scully asks, not to take anything away from my Saints, but did Saturday show that Josh Gibson is the Hawks' most important player? Uh, I think structurally, that's a pretty good argument. Um, you know, he's, he's so valuable, not only defensively, but the rebound and that third man up stuff. He, yeah, I mean, he leads the league every year for spoils and 1% as he's, what's the word? Uh, I can't think of it, go on. Important? Important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I don't want to get in a discussion of you, they had Gibson out because I'd like to have Carlisle, I'd like to have Nathan Freeman, yeah. Roberton, Dunstan, Webster. I just think it's interesting though because despite the fact he's won best and fairest and um, you know he's, he's higher rated now but still when you talk about Hawthorne you're talking first about you know Mitchell. It's funny how he ended Hodge. up at Hawthorne because at North he wasn't a great player but he no. always played well against Hawthorne because yeah. he was mates with Buddy and it was a personal... <laughs> It's, it's an interesting dynamic. Buddy's not there and he's, he's now a Hawk champion. OK, I think we've got time for one more tweet here. And it is from Damo, who asks, are we marking Frio too hard? Two games in Melbourne versus top eight teams and a derby. They're one win short of par for mine. Um, I reckon pretty disappointing early, but the last two weeks, I wouldn't say ominous, but they're certainly getting back. I mean, the derby, they played some reasonable footy. And but for that start to the North Melbourne game, that was pretty much back to sort of the standard we expect. You've got to remember, they were 9-0 last year, so we're talking about a, a pretty dramatic fall from grace. 9-0 <clears throat> to 0-4. Yeah. We'll see what, how the next few weeks play out. Well, perhaps they're just doing it differently this time, and, and they are scoring more, so I'll give Ross Lyon some credits for that. Uh, well, that, there you have it. There's this week's Keyboard Q&A. Uh, it's a great segment. Great questions, too. Really impressed with the standard of them. Make sure Finey gets a few of yours as well. His Twitter account's still a bit quiet. Got to ramp it up a bit. So use that footyology hashtag. We'll do everything in our powers, Finey, to answer them. I've just come up with one. What? Fremantle Dockers, the Dugites. As in? From Perth? Yeah, the band from Perth that were no good. You haven't mention a band any earlier than about 1980 at this stage. I know we oh, live right. in the past a bit on this show. I don't, I don't no, no, you're right. There probably hasn't been a decent Australian yeah, band in the last exactly. 15 years. Well, let's get to another break. And when we come back, the segment that has former footy greats trampling over each other in the rush to snag the passenger seat in Finey's car. Look, I suppose we all tangle with this question, Chris. Um, tomato sauce, do you put it in the fridge or in the pantry? Uh... I don't make big statements straight after the game, um, so I'm going to dodge that one a little bit. Um. Welcome back to the show and to the segment where Finey and I go for a spin and spin some yarns with a former star taking a trip down memory lane. And today we catch up with a member of North Melbourne's history-making 1975 Premiership side. Get ready for Stars in Cars. <laughs> Well, here we are, right in front of, actually there's only one football ground ever in suburban Melbourne that was between gasometers and a quarry. Of course we're at 
Arden Street in North Melbourne with the centre man and hero of their first ever premiership, John Burns. How are you, Burnsy? I'm fine, Mark. Yourself? I'm Mark Fine. We got Ro- I like <laughs> we got, that. We got Rowan in the back seat. Rowan Connolly. He'll get the bloke bobbing up back there. Like Jerry G. And we're starting our drive at North Melbourne, but that's certainly not where your career started. It was a a very long, circuitous road to North Melbourne. Well, it first started out, Mark, in uh, I was uh, zoning was out in that in those years, and uh, I was zoned to Fitzroy, and uh, I obviously showed some ability, and uh, I had to go down and play a practice match at the old Brunswick Oval, and uh, I did that. But when I got to the ground on the Sunday morning to partake in the game, I didn't have any football boots, so. I wasn't, didn't seem to be a very dedicated sort of player. It's like a bricklayer going to do a house without his trowel. So <laughs> consequently, I got a lot of a pair of Kevin Murray, got a nice old touch-up by John Murphy, and Bill Stevens said, look, I don't think you're ready. Go back to the country and uh, we'll catch you on the roundabout. I went back and I had some friends that were in Tassie and they put the feelers out and uh, I got an offer to go to East Launceston in 1969. God, that's a long time ago. And uh, I went over there and played one year there with uh, in, in Tasmania. We actually won a premiership and that year was a carnival in 69 which I was fortunate enough to be a part of and uh, I obviously played my part in that particular uh, role for Tasmania although we don't think we won a game but uh, we pushed a couple of the bigger sides. Now that carnival actually did Doc play for Tasmania? Was that, was that his first, played, year, first year back from Absolutely. Uh, you know, my my thoughts of Tasmanians are just, you know, they, they just roll on. You know, Baldock, Stewart, who I just loved and admired and loved watching because of the way he played in the centre. But, you know, and there's a list of thousands that you can go on. But uh, he certainly did play that uh, that carnival. And when he first came to training, uh, because there were three three uh, different leagues in that uh, in Tassie at the time and they met in the centre and they trained and I watched him train and I was supposed to be training but I was just watching him bouncing two balls at once and whatever other tricks he could do I was just gobsmashed by it and loved him with a passion. Pubs and knock shops that's what North Melbourne <laughs> well, used I, to be I, famous I, well, for. You had a pub. Well, let me tell you I had a pub but I don't know the other uh, I've had, I have heard of those uh, establishments, but not, not for me. Well, I presume there was a fair bit of traffic from the first to the latter, was there? Um, no doubt about that. Uh, if I think that. I think what I'm meaning what you said there, Rowan, but, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I was a... Um, a good boy. Well, I wouldn't say a good boy, but uh, one of those things didn't uh, interest me. Uh, I was married at the time with a lovely wife and still have at this stage 40, 44 years. Give her a plug, go on. Well, Beverly and Ona, she's, uh, she's, just, she's just a star. And uh, so and she was in the hotel with us, uh, and, and, and actually all my kids, actually. So that was a family affair. Now, 44 years, 44 was a famous number. I think it was. Ah, yes. Was that in 75? When 75, ba- yeah. When Barry Cable, the champ, left his jumper at home and wore number 44? Correct. That's now, unlike like him, isn't it? Wasn't you he wouldn't, a, you the wouldn't, master? So I, I've got to know where this famous pub, the courthouse, just was. Just keep going and first left. Well, how did he do it? Wasn't he the master of preparation? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a seventh wonder of the world, why, how he would do that, because he'd be out with his jumper on his boots on at 9.30 in the morning getting ready for the game uh, uh, before every game. He, I, was, he was just something else, Barry. And I, I, I could fill in the blanks that. there because I've spoken to Barry a couple of times, a few times actually, and... The story goes that he was an absolute, as you said, stickler for preparation. They're the best. But yeah, so Barry's wife, Helen, um, took the duties of he wanted the jumper to be absolutely perfect, pristine, clean, and washed. And she washed and pressed it the night before. And miscommunication, unfortunately. Yeah, no, that's. Uh, he, that's... Went, he, he left without it. It was sitting there folded absolutely perfectly on the end of his bed apparently and it wouldn't and it, it wouldn't affect it barry because uh, he, he'd uh, he'd just go past that because as soon as he hit the ground he was a different person so we we're 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 in errol street one of the famous streets of north melbourne there we are there was a coal supermarket here when we were playing football as you see it's not here any longer nice we town have, hall we have the town halls are lovely picturesque and then we have yeah. the lovely courthouse here over there where i uh, ended up uh, owning this particular establishment for a, a period of time. Oh, but yeah, I've eaten here. It's now, gone all up market. This reckon, is a well, famous pub. Well, uh, Rowan, uh, when I had it, 
I had a sawn-off shotgun and a baseball bat under the counter. <laughs> really? And that's a fact. Uh, I still Preparing have... for Olympic sporting events? Well, you know, there's uh, the activities in that particular time <laughs> and era were different to what uh, are now. Um, Did you so... ever have cause to use either of them? I've. Uh, they've both been in. They've both. Yes. I've got to get this story out. 1975. I mean, this is you, you only. There's only ever going to be 20 blokes who are part of North Melbourne or any club's first premiership, I mean. Correct. Uh, depending on what era they played, and it can be anything from 18 to 22, I guess. But this is a, an incredible afternoon of football. You kicked the first goal. Is that? Did you kick? You certainly were busy early. Uh, the first goal was kicked by me, and I think it was measured at about six, nearly 70 yards, to be brutally honest with you, Mark. So, but look, that could, that could be a little bit either way. It could be 68, 70. But, but you did pump the ball. I mean, your, your leg sort of... <laughs> it like was. A, look, I did kick the first goal, well, and I had to add that to Mike it. Mike Williamson was commentating his every chance. Remember Blighty's famous goal for yeah. sorry. He says, oh, you'd have to kick this 90, 95 metres. <laughs> so so yeah, that's you're right. That would have made the ground 375 metres long. <laughs> yeah. But... Coming into that game, there was an injury cloud over you, and what seems now to be the most easily detected subterfuge worked brilliantly. Just explain how you concocted an idea to keep well, keep Hawthorne off well, the scent. Well, you know, like as as much as you hate Hawthorne, uh, and you know, I've said this quite regularly, but. Um, you ju- I just admire him. We did a documentary for another, Channel Seven years ago, and, uh, and oh, the, the final the, story. Yeah. yeah, and the same thing was applied. You know, they said they're Hawthorne. I said, well, stuff Hawthorne. You know, they, you know, we played football. We enjoyed football. When you played Hawthorne, and I'd like to go out on a Saturday night and have a wine or this and that, blah blah blah. But when you played Hawthorne, you couldn't make any any arrangements because you didn't know where you end up because of the way they play their <laughs> football. So, and this is why I admire them, and still to this day, way they go about their business. They're so good. They're so professional. They're so close, and that that is great. So I did have an injury, I had a shoulder injury. I don't know if it was my genius thoughts, but I think the medical staff or somebody, some smart person in the medical staff, felt that. Uh, Okay, they, they'll have a crack at me uh, because of uh, uh, maybe because of the shoulder. Maybe they thought I might stand up to the pressure. I don't know. But anyway, we uh, taped up the uh, opposite shoulder to what the uh, good one was, and sure enough, out they come, and out come Hawthorne, and every opportunity, the way they went, they started hitting the right shoulder, which was as good as goal. This is where they used to have two up. Uh, sorry. Uh, not allowed to say that, eh? Of course you are. Oh, okay, yeah. We used to go to two up here and uh, uh, play that. See, isn't it amazing how how has it changed? It was so much fun in those days. You'd go, you'd do your training, and uh, I don't think I could, uh, and I suppose a few others I hope would be the same. I don't think we could play these days. What modern footballers, and they know what they're missing. They, they believe, oh. they know that they don't get the, the same friendships, the same social life that Correct. the old footballer had. And whatever's been lost in footy, whatever was great about playing it and about the great privilege it was to be a lead footballer with the mateship and the and the doors that would open. I reckon we've got the living, breathing example of it. John? Mateship was great, the doors open too. But these young guys, they do get a good pay packet. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's something. And in saying the pay packet, I can't see that envelope. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry? Well, I'll tell you what I do have for you. <laughs> I've got the most genuine handshake a bloke could give. <laughs> You're an absolute ripper. I thought you were going to say you got the baseball bat and gun under no, the uh, it's, it's, it's in my car just up there. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> Been a pleasure. Pleasure. Nice meeting you, son. John Burns, sentiment in the 1975 Premiership, and I can tell you this, and he'll only say maybe, but I'll say definitely, had there been a Norm Smith medal, we'd be talking to the man who won the Norm Smith medal the day North won their first flag. Thanks a lot, John. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, mate. Just brilliant. Welcome back, and now we come to that part of the show that AFL clubs are clutching butt cheeks about. They might be in the top eight, but just where will they end up on this week's Credibility Ladder? And welcome back, John Pirrick. Good to be back. Uh, Very good guest this week. Well done. You must bring in some more friends of yours from time to time. We'll see what we can do. Well, let's get into the Credibility Ladder. And uh, last two weeks, it's been a pretty automatic choice for number one. We had Essendon a couple of weeks ago. Your Saints last week, Finey. What do we reckon this week? Who are you voting for, John? 
the Blues. Okay, well, it's not the Blues. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lobbying very heavily much. this week <laughs> for uh, Brisbane at number one. Outstanding win. No one rates him. Everyone wrote them off as a member of the bottom three. Lost Stefan Martin during the game. You bet it was a good win. They've lost him. They're lucky they just didn't lose him for the rest of the game. And uh, beat a highly rated, or, well, you know, higher rated <laughs> side in Gold Coast. Any arguments? Oh, third, third win since the bye last year. Same amount as the Pies and Blues. Yep. They mm -hmm. just pull them out occasionally, don't mm -hmm. they? Just need to string a few more of them together. Just on that very quickly, these Derby showdowns, Q clashes. Yep. Any, any results up for grabs. Often the outsider wins. Yeah. No, Q Clash has definitely got a bit more credibility about it now. Okay. Now, the next debate, I think, is going to be fairly spirited. I reckon, personally, we've got three pretty decent contenders for second on our credibility later this week. They are Adelaide, in got up in the game of the season. GWS, crushing win over Port Adelaide. And your Saints, Finey, gallant in defeat. Oh, I hate the words in defeat, but they were good. So what I'm are we going to go to the Saints, actually. You know, playing the defending champions. Had McCartan kicked that goal, they probably would have won the game. So this um, is what it's all about. Some controversy down there. I know they lost, but they were playing a team that's really been unstoppable for most of the year. And looks this will be unheralded, incredible. So I'm going to go to the Saints. History, something controversial. Having a defeated <laughs> team second on the ladder. I just think it's a bridge too far right at the moment, John. Yeah. I, I think Adelaide set the standard. Finey? I thought Adelaide were brilliant. Look, that was... I agree with you. There was... A heavyweight battle, eight points, top four teams, and they came through with flying colours. Adelaide for mine, actually. Okay, Adelaide second on Adelaide. Sorry, JP, you will um, Again. win. You will win one of no these votes you. one week. <laughs> okay, so GWS versus St Kilda. I, I'm sticking with the Giants here. I think, uh, look, yes, Port were insipid, but you can't really beat what's out there, and they, they look pretty powerful unit at the moment in G their second home of Canberra. GWS were brilliant. They were brilliant. They beat them along there. They thrashed Port there. They were merciless. I, I think GWS are almost unlucky not to be second. Okay, do you want to have a token? I'll stick for the same, with the same <laughs> okay. again. In the dead rubber boat. <laughs> Can't drop them now. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> Adelaide second, GWS third, St Kilda fourth. Next, uh, now this is an interesting debate because Melbourne, terrific win over Collingwood. And again, Collingwood, pretty insipid, but great effort by the Demons, playing some really positive attacking football. But I, I'm going to put my hand up here for a defeated team. I think Sydney, you know, toss of the coin job that game. They could have won it. Fantastic effort away from home. They've been terrific all year and, and lost absolutely nothing with that defeat. So I've actually got Sydney fractionally ahead of the Demons. No, I'm going to stick with the Demons on this one. I mean, they were still coming into that game 1-2. They've got horror stories against Collingwood over the last few years. Demons had a big win. Good okay, win. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with the Demons as here. well. Yep, yep. So you've gone for the Demons as well? Yeah. Well, that's interesting because I've made an executive decision and Sydney actually finishes ahead of Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, who's doing this letter? You well, really get no respect at all, do you? <laughs> no. We feign consensus and then I decide who's going fifth. Uh, so Melbourne just under Sydney, obviously. We'll zip through that middle yeah. part of it because there are a few routine wins over the weekend. Uh, that's probably being a bit unfair to North Melbourne because they beat a vastly improved Fremantle, so they're seventh on our ladder. West Coast got the job done against Richmond. Essendon, decent effort in defeat against the Cats. I think people thought they'd lose by a lot more than that. Bulldogs got the job done against Carlton. Hawthorne, that's pretty... Yeah, that's, that's pretty low. Well, that is probably our lowest winning side so far, but, you know, in their alleged fortress at Launceston, you would have expected them to have a better win than that. So they're getting the job done, but need to improve on our credibility later. Geelong next, just just a win, I reckon. Well Fremont. behind the team that beat them. Correct. Well, you know, given their respective abilities, I think that's fair enough. Fremantle next, uh, still in a hole, but form clearly on the improve. I think they'll be breaking their duck next week. Below them, the Blues, getting a bit of a similar refrain, this, isn't it? They sort of have a, have a crack. Got within four goals in the last quarter, but you never thought they were going to win. Gold Coast, really ordinary. Bit of a uh, wake-up call for the Suns. Might have just got a little ahead of themselves. And probably the last decent debate we need to have, reasonably quickly, is Collingwood, Richmond, Port Adelaide. Who's on the? Who takes out the wooden spoon? Port Adelaide. Four? Port for sure. Clearly. Port Adelaide just takes the wooden spoon. So terrible. And look, it's mm. immaterial, really. But Colling no, it's not. Collingwood, Richmond, who finishes above whom? I think we've got to put Collingwood above Richmond. 
Why? To back up Trelaw's claim that Collingwood's got a bit of less enrichment. <laughs> well, they're both in a power of trouble, coaches both under pressure, but we have decided in round four that the Pies just take the points over the Richmond, over, uh, the Richmond, the Tigers, 16 and 17 on our ladder. That's our credibility ladder for this week. Thanks for coming in, JP. Thanks, guys. Uh, you're not going to be here next week, are you? No, just having a short sabbatical. Well, uh, you, it's your job to appoint your replacement, and uh, in the tradition of replacements, don't make them too, too good, or you might not have a job <laughs> when you come back. Uh -oh. Thanks for joining us this week <laughs> Thanks, again. Guys. Time for our final break, but don't go away, because Fanny and I are angry. We're not sure what we're angry about just yet, but a few seconds are all we need to work up a ladder of which Palm Olive would be very envious indeed. See you in a moment. CGU just launched a fantastic coach's insurance. Have you got it? No. I th do you think you should get it? No. What do you think you know about the competition? You don't know. Welcome back. And there's nowhere to hide when Fanny and I get wound up about our favourite sport. We're fighting football stupidity on the beaches, in the hills, and if necessary, with each other. We shall never surrender. Move over, Winston Churchill, because it's time for our angst against the clock in the footyology rant off. That was a power-packed opening spell, Fanny. I think rant I need to recover. Off. Do you, are you one of those people when they act... It's slow motion. You actually move in slow motion. <laughs> I don't know. It's the all camera getting, will do it for it's you. It's all getting a bit theatrical. <laughs> so give you a chance to recover. And I'm going to count you in. You're going first in the rant off today. Three, two, one, rant. We enter day four of the murder trial, Stephen May on Stephen Martin. I mean, this has been overblown to a ridiculous proportion. Yes, he got him. He heard him. He put him down. I mean, let's face it, Stephen Martin's six foot six and got a name like a South Yarra hairdresser. I didn't mind to see him put on his ass, to be honest. But in 2016, political correctness says that we have to look at it as though it was murder on the football field. People have been calling for the send off rule, the death penalty. I mean, honestly, was it that bad? He's already been found <coughs> guilty by the court of public opinion. And I can tell you this much. It's the end of May, probably till the end of May. He's going to get five or six weeks. It's not fair to him, and it's not fair to football history. Here's what I really hate. It's that we're being told that his behaviour belonged in the 70s or 80s. Hang on. I liked football in the 70s and 80s. I mean, am I supposed to feel guilty that I liked Carl Dittrich? That I thought Robbie Muir was funny and dangerous and I liked him for it? You know what? I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to mention Lee Matthews' name anymore. It's like listening to Gary Glitter. It's revisionist and it's dangerous and it's... I don't know what to do anymore, but I'll tell you this much. I now am a... I'm, I'm a reformed football person. I'm not, the, I'm not the beast that liked footy in the 70s or 80s. I was a horrible person then. I like football now. I want to see players kick goals, take marks. I don't want to see them get bumped or hurt or even get a boo-boo on their knee. I'm all reconstructed. I'm a new football fan and I hate violence. Not. Very good. And I agree with you. Uh, just one problem. That was about two and a half minutes instead of one minute. So a bit of editing and uh, I think we'll just about get it down pat. You know, you know what? <laughs> I tell you, if I wrote it down and put it on the auto prompt, it would almost be perfect. I don't know, I think the hordes are about to storm the studio here. Either that okay. or, the, or the table tennis tournament is currently <laughs> in its last... <laughs> Count me in. Count me in. Three, two, rant. I don't know what's going on at Port Adelaide, Finey. They used to be a grassroots footy club, proud of their working class origins and happy enough just with Albert and Oval as a home. Now all of a sudden they want to colonise China and their president's so drunk on power he's just about calling for a royal commission into Sunday's loss against GWS. David Koch went bananas on Twitter the other night, calling the defeat a disgrace. Rest assured questions are being asked and answers demanded. Undermines a historic week, he said. Jeez, Kochi, that's the sort of language Chairman Mao was throwing around when he and the Gang of Four were trying to implement the Cultural Revolution. What are you going to do now? Make Ken Hinckley read the Little Red Book and renounce the capitalist system? 
Trouble is, when you call a bad loss to a team that might actually be pretty good a disgrace, there's not much left to go with your hyperbole. If that's a disgrace, what do you call that Cochise Angels rubbish on Sunrise where you round up every peanut social commentator and let them talk absolute drivel for 10 minutes? What do you call having to get the latest on Samantha Armitage's love life every half a bloody hour? Now they're genuine crimes against the state. And why does Port Adelaide have to conquer China anyway, just because you like your Sang Choi Bao? This is a steak and three veg club, Kochi. Stop trying to turn it into the bloody flower drum. That is very good. But I'm telling you, the Chinese game's going ahead. Yeah? I've got proof positive. Do you know China's already organised the pre-match entertainment? Oh, this will be good. The number one band in China, and all I can say is... Have you got it? Meatloaf, you're about to become the second worst of all time. This will be the pre-match entertainment in China for Port Adelaide's game. They're good. Excellent. They're good. That'll go down well with the punters. Can we get them for grand final day as well? Maybe they could do it. Maybe Meatloaf can be the uh, undercard. And Corey Wingard can do the scoreboard announcements. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, that's it for this week. Uh, I'll give you a quick final thought for the day. My final thought is how to vote, because we have not got a vote oh, yet. Oh, yes. How do you vote for our rant off? Well, we have not got a vote yet, so I've completely simplified it this week. All you have to do is register a racehorse, harness horse or greyhound, and then name it. And in the name put in either Finey or Rocco. So something like Finey Adi Adios or Zabil Rocco, the horse has to run at a registered race. So you've got to get it to the track, name it, and then we'll count the votes. Should be simple. Far Rocco lap. I like the sound of it. Yeah. Rocco no go will be the name of my horse. Thanks for joining us once again at Footyology. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the show again. We're on every Tuesday at 12 p.m. on YouTube or 7.30 p.m. on Channel 31. And remember, people, as Freddie Mercury famously put it in that song, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? No, you're caught in a landslide. There's no escape from footyology. See you next week. <laughs>